Dr. Rich Ann Lompkin joined us last week to uh, discuss how not to meet your state veterinarian. And tonight we have Dr. Jennifer Martin, CSU Extension Meat Specialist and uh, in the College of Animal Sciences there at Colorado State University. Um, Jennifer, I think you're going to, have we tested your slides to make sure that they work? Yep, we have. Usually my crew does wonderful <laughs> and I can't do this without my support crew. So um, Beth Delaire from Pueblo County is the Agriculture and Natural Resources Coordinator for Pueblo County. And then the guy who really got me into this business, MJ Fisher, is the county director in Pueblo, as well as the interim regional director uh, for the southern region there. So we, I want to say thank you to those two tonight. Um, just a few housekeeping things. We're going to try to keep our um, videos down and probably our mics muted until we get towards the end of the meeting. So we'll let Dr. Martin get through all of her important information. And uh, tonight I gave her the topic of ranch to consumer. Um, and we'll see what she has come up with there um, with that lovely array of blackbirds behind your head there, Jennifer. So I'm going to turn this over to you and we'll get started. Awesome. Well, thanks, Travis, for one, for the introduction and the invitation. And I'm glad that you thought they were blackbirds. I have a lot of people who think their screens are dirty. So they are birds. <laughs> There's no debris on your screen right now. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and um, look forward to talking with you all today about uh, ranch to consumer markets and beef and then some of the challenges that exist in this space, as well as opportunities. Um, just a brief introduction about myself, like Travis mentioned, I do serve as an extension specialist uh, for the meat industry, so uh, that's a relatively uh, recent appointment, uh, something that I assumed the role of uh, about a year ago, so prior to that, uh, Colorado State University was without a meat extension specialist for almost, or a little over a decade actually, so I'm very happy to be in a position where I can work directly with uh, extension uh, like we see with MJ and Travis and Beth and many, many other agents, uh, but also with industry members of the meat and livestock sectors. Um, and this topic has been one that uh, has certainly, um, I think, been a conversation around Colorado for quite some time, but in the past couple of years, the, the conversations have risen uh, and some of the challenges have been highlighted, but also some of the opportunities that exist in this space uh, have been recognized. Um, but I think as we have this conversation, one of the things that I like to start with is just why, like what, what's going on in the state of the consumer and the state of the beef industry that makes this ranch to consumer market such an appealing market for beef producers. And I think it really starts with some of the changes that we've seen in the American consumer. So what we know about the American consumer is that they demand uh, beef that's affordable. It has to be accessible to them to purchase. Uh, they demand and have demanded for quite uh, several decades now uh, beef that is uh, in high quality. So good tasting beef, flavorful beef. That's something that we've come to expect with beef. It's, it, you know, the, the, the whole slogan is beef is what's for dinner is based off of the flavor of beef and the desire that consumers have for that flavor is something that they uh, maintain very steadfast uh, reliance on. The other thing that the American consumer expects is for beef products to be safe. Uh, and safety in the beef industry is something that we view as uh, non-competitive. That expectation is there by the consumer, and we have a responsibility and an obligation in all factors of the industry to deliver beef products that are safe. And they've come to rely on that safety of beef. Um, they also demand more and more uh, the availability of healthy and nutritious options. And the beef industry has responded to that really well by investing in reducing uh, plate fat waste, right? So the, the reducing the external fat uh, present on beef cuts and re offering uh, lean ground beef options in the grocery store. So consumers say they want it, the industry has responded. The other thing that I always like to talk about with my students here on campus uh, is the American consumer wants products to be convenient. And when you look at the history of the beef industry and how we used to, when you think about your parents or grandparents, how they procured beef products to consume, 
it's changed quite a bit today where uh, due to uh, modern science and uh, how, how society has changed, it, changed over time, consumers today can go to the grocery store around the clock and have access to high quality, fresh, safe, nutritious, uh, and uh, affordable beef. And that's something that is a reflection of their demand. They want to be able to access beef uh, around the clock in, in a way that's convenient to them. What we're seeing though, over the past couple of decades is this shift from those factors that I mentioned, those first five, to some new things that consumers are focusing on. Uh, they are looking for beef and livestock producers that are addressing uh, environmental concerns. So the topic of sustainability is something that consumers now say is important to them and is value to, valuable to them. Uh, they're uh, concerned about animal welfare and animal well-being, and they're looking for beef producers and beef suppliers who are addressing animal well-being, either through marketing uh, or through relationships with the producers themselves. And then one of the things that's been most vote or most noticeable um, in the past couple of decades is this desire that consumers have for transparency, of wanting to know more. And one way they achieve that transparency is through information. And access to information tends to be easier when the person producing the beef that they can buy at the grocery store or the restaurant uh, or that they can buy online is local to them uh, and someone that they can make a personal connection to. Uh, so the American consumer has changed and we've seen these changes be reflected in the marketplace for beef. Some of the other reasons why consumers are really interested in uh, beef products that are direct from producers or that are locally procured is there's a really growing distrust uh, in large scale commercial production. So uh, frequently, uh, consumer surveys are conducted either by the beef industry or by the Food Marketing Association or by the uh, Grocery Suppliers Association, where they're looking at shopper behaviors and they're looking at consumer behaviors at the point of purchase uh, at restaurants to see what consumers value and asking consumers uh, what's important to them, what are they willing to pay for, what are they concerned about. And as it relates to beef production, what consumers have been really highlighting over the past decade uh, is that they are concerned about a couple of really important pieces of information. One of those is just large-scale commercial production in general, or what they term factory farming. That phrase has been coined and is pretty popular in uh, you know, social media and on the news itself. And so consumers have indicated that that term is one that they're not comfortable with and that they're concerned about it. They've also shown that they're concerned about the use of hormones and antibiotics in livestock production, particularly in beef production. And their concerns for those three are reflected in their purchasing behavior. Uh, when these surveys have asked consumers how familiar they are with terms like factory farming or what happens in spaces that may utilize factory farming. Many of them have heard of factory farming or have heard of large scale commercial production. They're concerned about it, but they're really not familiar with it. So even if they've heard of it, and even if they're concerned about it, they don't know enough about it to know what's happening in that space. And that lack of information uh, in the consumer's eyes generally creates and enhances concern. So it's one of those things where, in this case, ignorance is not bliss for the consumer. In fact, ignorance about the process oftentimes creates fear about what they don't know. Uh, and in some cases, uh, incorrect assumptions about what's going on uh, within this space. The other thing that we've seen consumers that's driving this push for consumers to seek different routes to get beef products is a consumer definition of quality is changing. And so when we talk about quality, I always start with the picture that you see on the left-hand side. And this is a hierarchy or a triangle of needs. And we're incredibly fortunate in the United States that we're able to meet most of these needs pretty easily. And because we're able, as a U.S. beef industry, we have an adequate supply of meat. We have a highly safe and wholesome food system that produces safe and wholesome beef. And then largely because of investments at the producer level and improving through genetics and nutrition, the quality and flavor and color and juiciness and tenderness, uh, we have a high quality beef industry where we have a, access to a lot of high quality beef. Those bottom three pieces of the triangle for the most part are met. Um, we talk, uh, we were in class last week and on campus and we're talking about in Fort Collins, for example, the U.S. beef industry has gotten 
so good at producing high quality beef that you cannot find select at a grocery store in Fort Collins. It's difficult to find what we would deem lower quality beef, which is, again, a tremendous reflection of what's happened in the beef industry. But because we're so good at producing high quality, safe, nutritious, accessible beef, consumers now have the ability to focus on other things, these extrinsic traits or these extrinsic qualities. And those are the things that are important to the consumer that reflect on their definition of quality. So it may not have anything to do with the taste or flavor or juiciness or tenderness when we think about quality in a traditional sense, but they really reflect, reflect the things that are important to consumers. And when you take a look at this uh, word uh, map on the right-hand side, when consumers were asked what is quality, some of those key uh, traditional things, tender, taste, juicy, they come up, uh, but we also see locally sourced. Uh, we see Angus, they are interested in what breed of cattle. Again, more information, organic, never, um, never frozen, free range. These terms, hormone free that you see here in the center, these terms that may not be a good reflection of the tenderness, juiciness, flavor, safety, or wholesomeness of the product, but they're still traits that are important to the consumer. And so when we think about quality today and how a consumer views quality of beef, it's much more complex than those traits that we've historically looked at as a beef industry of focusing on how can we make more flavorful beef and how can we make more tender or juicy beef. Today, consumers want more. And one of the reasons why they want more is because we're able to deliver as an industry on the things that they historically wanted. And we see that reflected in consumer purchasing habits. So this, uh, every year, uh, the Food Marketing uh, Association collects shopper data. Uh, so I, I joke with my students that you think those loyalty cards at the grocery store, that scanner that's scanning your meat packages, isn't collecting data. It's actually collecting quite a bit of data. And they're looking at shopper habits and what people are actually buying and how those trends change over time. What we've seen is that shoppers in the meat department are looking for labels that indicate certain attributes or certain properties of the meat. A couple of those that are really, really dominating uh, current trends are produ uh, products that are raised in the U.S., products that are considered all natural or hormone-free, antibiotic-free, locally raised, grass-fed. These terms that, again, may not directly connect to um, tenderness, juiciness, and flavor, those traditional terms that reflect quality, but do reflect what's important to a consumer. When you look over at the right-hand side, this is some more recent data. This is from 2020. Looking at the same thing, some of the things that are important, local. So if a, if a package of beef lists the farmer state, uh, if it's natural, we still see tenderness, juiciness, all of those things are important, but consumers say we want that plus. Uh, so it's quality plus today when we talk about the definition of quality. So what does this mean uh, as it relates to a beef producer? Uh, and I think the biggest thing that the beef industry has realized and beef producers has realized is this is an opportunity uh, for producers and processors to diversify the beef market in a way that adds value to their business or operation. So if we can capitalize on consumer desires for local or for all, nat or, uh, all uh, free range or grass fed or organic or some of these terms that they deem important, we can see that reflect in profitability. And consumers say in their pockets show that in many cases, they're willing to pay a premium of up to 10 to 20% for those local products that meet those definitions of quality that they now expect. So it still has to be safe, still has to be you know, good flavor, tender, juicy. But if it's all of those things, plus it's local, or if it's all of those things and it's local and it's grass fed, we see premiums on those products, which add value to the producer and processor of the, of the meat. So we still have to remember that at the end of the day, consumers still want beef that is safe, palatable, tender, juicy, flavorful, it's convenient and it's affordable. But if you can guarantee that, there is an opportunity that exists uh, in marketing beef to consumers in a way that highlights on some of these other things that are important to them. So, when we have this conversation about, okay, here's what consumers say that they want, here's what their pockets say that they're willing to pay for, uh, here's the opportunity that exists for producers and processors, we have to kind of go back and examine, well, how can we as an industry actually meet that? Uh, so if the need is there by consumers, they're willing to pay for it, what routes exist 
in the commercial U.S. beef industry to get that to the consumer, where they can actually have a product that's available for purchase, meeting the demands that they've indicated that they want. So I think it's important to reflect for a second on how beef moves from ranch, from a ranch to the plate. And when you look at uh, many of the classical uh, pictograms or depictions of uh, the supply chain, uh, they look a lot like the one you see on your screen now. We talk about a feedstock producer with some uh, breeding components going to a cow calf and stock or feedlot processing, either uh, to a further processor or a wholesale and then retail food service. And there's importing and exporting all mixed in here. And this is what the traditional pathway when we think about the commercial beef industry looks like. Uh, and then ultimately at the end, we have these products that end up consumers. But what we've seen and what you all are familiar with is there's a desire for this to change. And we've seen structurally that changes have existed for quite some time, but how today can we capitalize on opportunities that exist outside of this traditional beef supply chain? So when we think about the beef supply chain from a non-commercial perspective, so not necessarily through a feedlot, but if we start with finished cattle, and those finished cattle come from cattle producers, we have two pathways in which they can end up at the consumer. One of those, both of those go through processing plants. If they go through processing plants that are USDA or federally inspected or an equivalent, and we'll talk about what that equivalent is here in a second, uh, they have access to retail food service, that further processing wholesale, that sector, and then to consumers. And then we have another piece of the pie that is a processing plant that's not federally inspected or does not have the equivalent of federal inspection. And that's a little trickier in how products from those animals end up at the plate of consumer and what that means for a rancher. So as we talk about this different version of the beef supply chain that does not resemble the commercial supply chain that most consumers are used to when they think about beef that they buy at the grocery store, it's important that we examine some of the reasons why it's different. And I think that starts with inspection. So when we think about the inspection programs that exist, uh, there are four basic types of inspection that exist in the United States. Uh, the first of that is federal inspection, which is generally considered the gold standard. We'll talk about that one here in a second in a bit more detail. Uh, state inspection, um, that's currently not available in Colorado, and I'm happy to talk, uh, talk about state inspection in the state of Colorado if there's time at the end of the presentation. Custom exemption and then personal exemption. So each of these are routes by which a consumer has the ability to take an animal and consume meat from that animal. Sometimes the consumer is the owner of the animal, sometimes the consumer is not the owner of the animal. The most traditional sense is the federal inspection program. And there are some basic, basic tenets of federal inspection. And it's really, you know, as a, a meat scientist, as a, a meat nerd, if you will, um, the foundation of the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Program really is rooted in food safety and making sure that products going into commerce for consumption by consumers are wholesome and safe for consumption. And many people don't know this, but the whole premise of the, of the Federal Meat Inspection Act that started the federal inspection program actually occurred in the turn of the 19th or the 20th century uh, in the early 1900s when there wasn't a Federal Meat Inspection Act and uh, unwell or uh, unhealthy animals were entering into the food chain. There were some rampant food safety issues that were occurring in commercial meat packers. Um, and it was not only a huge liability, a huge public health risk, but it could have been catastrophic for the entire meat industry if it were not addressed. So in early 1900 and 1906, in fact, we passed as a country the Federal Meat Inspection Act. And that Federal Meat Inspection Act requires that all meat sold commercially must be inspected and passed to ensure that it is safe, wholesome, and properly labeled. So when we talk about the Federal Meat Inspection Act and federal inspection today, you know, many of us probably think, well, gosh, it's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of hassle with it. But it's still rooted in that premise of products passing through those facilities are inspected to protect the health of the consumers who will consume the products. A couple of nuances with uh, the Federal Meat Inspection Act, and it's quite nuanced if you want to get into the, the details of it, but it does require continuous inspection and the on-site uh, on presence of inspectors prior to and after harvest. And that can be a challenge. Uh, for beef producers, uh, especially uh, in Colorado that we've seen over the past year. Some of the reasons why 
uh, people might pursue federal inspection or wine facilities have federal inspection. Again, it's an integral component of public health and food safety programs uh, from a liability perspective. There's some processes in place that help to assure products aren't going into the food chain that might cause harm to humans. Uh, one of the biggest things that this program allows is it allows access to interstate and foreign markets. So any products that are exported um, must go through federal inspection as well as those that are sold across state lines that uh, requires a stamp of federal inspection that you see on the right hand side. Some of the things that are sort of unintended consequences, I think, but are helpful as it relates to federal inspection is it creates a more level playing field for meat processors. If all facilities were federally inspected, uh, there are regulations and standards that are required by the federal government uh, regarding labels or regarding processes or regarding access to resources. So it helps to alleviate some of these, the haves and the have nots uh, that we can sometimes see in other inspection programs. So federally inspected facilities do have a bit more consistency uh, than we see in other programs. I mentioned state inspection. State inspection we currently don't have in Colorado, uh, but one of the, the things about state inspection is it's intended for products that are sold and distributed within the state itself. Uh, and this requires, in order for this to happen, uh, a state meat and poultry inspection program, or an MPI. And one of the things that is uh, unique and interesting, I think, personally, about this, the state meat inspection program is these MPI programs must enforce requirements that are equal to federal inspection. So for a state meat inspection program, it's not as if there is a different set of standards for state inspection compared to a federal inspection. The standards have to be equal. And in some cases, they're actually greater than or higher than the standards implemented federally. Uh, one of the, the things about the state meat inspection program is it's not fully state funded. So USDA FSIS, uh, they provide up to 50% of the state's operating funds. So if a state elects to utilize a state inspection program to help support their meat processors, USDA will provide up to 50% of the funds to support that program. Uh, this program also allows for processors to participate in what's called a cooperative interstate shipping program. Um, this facilitates interstate commerce, where if you have a state inspection program that is the equivalent of a federal meat inspection program, those processing facilities or selected processing facilities that go through an approval and application process can have permission to uh, ship products across state lines. Uh, this does require evaluation by USDA, so it's not as if it's something that's managed by the state. USDA actually oversees the cooperative interstate program. Uh, to date, uh, there are 27 states that have um, state inspection programs. A uh, few of the facilities within those states have these cooperative interstate shipping programs. Uh, so something that's unique. Uh, we've seen some neighboring states that have explored this cooperative interstate shipping program to help their state inspected facilities have better market access. The one that we're probably all familiar with in Colorado uh, is the custom exemption program. And the custom exemption program allows for animals and the preparation of meat products from animals that belong to someone and are intended for the exclusive use of that person or the owner of the animal. So in Colorado, we have federally inspected facilities and we have custom exemption facilities. We also have facilities uh, in which a, an individual is harvesting animals that they own for their own consumption, and that's called a personal exemption, and that doesn't require inspection by the federal government. Uh, the, uh, the custom exemption programs or facilities, those are exempt from the Federal Meat Inspection Act. They do not have to have continuous inspection. They do not have to have a daily inspection of, uh, of inspectors. However, they are inspected by the state. So CEPs or these custom exempt facilities are periodically, not every day, not every month or every week, inspected by the state. Uh, and the state's records are then reviewed by USDA FSIS. So even though USDA FSIS is not directly involved with oversight or regulation of these custom exempt facilities, um, USDA is reviewing and is monitoring and is uh, auditing the records that the state has for inspection. Uh, so the custom exempt facilities, even though they're not, again, held to those same standards that a federally inspected facility might be, they're still held to the standards of not producing products that are adulterated or contaminated 
that are misbranded or mislabeled, and they do have the expectation for uh, accurate record keeping. Some of the things that we know about these facilities, products that come from a custom exempt facility must be labeled with the owner's name. So for me, if it said, if I have a steer that I'm taking to a processor, it must say Jennifer Martin and must be labeled with the phrase not for sale. And those cannot be sold outside of my ownership. So I can't take those uh, down to the farmer's market and sell them myself. That's against the law. Uh, the other thing that's uh, an important piece of the custom exemption program is that ownership of the animal must be established prior to slaughter. So if I bought a steer today and decide tomorrow I want to harvest him, I own that animal. But if tomorrow I want to buy the meat from that steer and it's processed in a custom exempt facility, I can't buy the meat. I have to buy the animal prior to harvest. And that must be established and documented through record keeping prior to slaughter. So in Colorado, uh, the Colorado Department of Agriculture licenses and inspects all custom exempt meat processors. Uh, like I mentioned before, although CDA is the state authority for this program, so they oversee all of their records. They're doing all uh, health inspections and sanitation set, uh, checks and environmental sampling um, records. Um, those are still subject to USDA inspection. And we've seen some uh, cases recently where USDA is actually inspecting the state's records. Uh, with intention, uh, and we can talk about why that is here in a second. So again, I wanted to point out what is not allowed within custom exemption, uh, and uh, these are important pieces that are often confused. Meat produced by a custom exempt processor may not be sold directly to consumers, and meat produced by a custom exempt processor may not be sold to a retail establishment, so a grocery store or restaurant. Uh, the only programs that have access directly to consumers or of the meat uh, directly to consumers or to a retail or food service establishment are products that have gone through a federally inspected facility or an equivalent, meaning a state inspected facility. So in the custom exempt facility, live shares of the animals can be sold and meat from those live shares can be sold, but the meat itself um, cannot be sold. So you may have heard of um, something that has uh, made my life a lot more interesting over the past couple of years. Uh, in 2021, uh, the Colorado legislature passed uh, uh, Senate Bill 21079, which we refer to as the Ranch to Plate Act. And the text of the Ranch to Plate Act is on your screen. A couple of um, key pieces of this Ranch to Plate Act that I think are important to point out. Uh, the animal or animal share of at least 1%. Uh, so that 1% is key. That's something that was new with the Ranch to Plate Act. Uh, the end consumer or the informed end consumer still does not have the ability to resell the product. And the meat itself that's produced under the Ranch to Plate Act or by a custom exempt facility operating under this act can only be sold in Colorado and still cannot, um, cannot cross state lines. The other new piece of the Ranch to Plate Act is that the end consumer must be informed either through a document passed by the seller to the consumer or the purchaser of the animal or a disclaimer saying that the seller itself, so the owner of the animal, is not subject to a public health inspection. Uh, so that does not exempt the processor. The, the owner of the animal is not uh, subject to uh, inspection uh, by the public health agency, which would be the Colorado Department of Agriculture. But a lot of people, when we saw the Ranch to Plate Act, all, you know, from a, a extension perspective, from an industry perspective, our first response was, what? <laughs> What does this mean? The language is quite confusing and confused quite a few people across the state of Colorado as to what it means and what it does not mean. And so we've worked a lot over the past year of trying to clarify uh, what access this gives to direct to consumer markets and what it does not give to direct to consumers markets. And so we're gonna talk through the reality. So it's easy to get tied up and to get bogged down by some of the the legalese that you see in the Ranch to Plate Act, but what does it actually mean at the production level and at the processing level? So the Ranch to Plate Act does not change the Colorado Department of Agriculture and or USDA's oversight of uh, custom exempt processors. They are still, the processors are still inspected by the Colorado Department of Agriculture. Those records are still reviewed regularly by the US Department of Agriculture. Ranchers, owners of cattle, sellers of the live animal shares, 
may not uh, sell directly to a producer. So we can sell the, or, or to a consumer. You can sell the live animal share still, but you can still not sell meat uh, directly to a producer. Likewise, the processor itself cannot sell meat directly to the consumer. Only meat that is part of an animal share agreement can be taken from the processor to the consumer. And that animal share agreement must be established prior to slaughter. So all that has really changed, if you look at the bottom bullet point there, is this allows ranchers to, to establish ownership shares as low as 1%. So prior to Ranch to Plate, it was about a quarter. Uh, that was the minimum share that a person could legally sell according to Colorado statute. Uh, with the Ranch to Plate Act, you can share as low as 1%. And there's a lot of discussion right now of, you know, how do you establish 1%? Is that 1% of the live animal weight? Is that 1% of the carcass weight? Are they monitoring for 1%? Um, and so those are some nuances that haven't yet, um, that haven't yet been completely addressed, but we still know that the basic tenets of custom exemption haven't changed. You still cannot move that product across uh, state lines, must maintain, uh, must stay within the state of Colorado and ownership of the animal and subsequent meat from that animal must be established prior to harvest or prior to slaughter of the animal. And those records of ownership must be provided to the processor prior to harvest. So whenever CDA is performing inspections at the processor, and they see that you know, steer A was sold to 25 different individuals or the meat from steer A was sold to 25 different individuals, they must provide documentation to CDA that says, here's the bill of sale of that animal prior to harvest. Here are the packages from that animal where each package of that, you know, say Joe B had 20% of that carcass, 20% of that meat has his name and a not for sale sticker on it. So those are all records that are still required, uh, same as it was prior to Ranch to Plate Act. So essentially, from a, a practical perspective, all that changes the ability to sell shares as low as 1%. And a lot of people have asked, you know, what, why is this something um, that we must respect and honor and abide by in the state of Colorado? Because in some cases, it seems to make it really difficult for ranchers and cattle producers to market beef to consumers. When we know the consumer appetite is there, we know consumers want beef that's produced in Colorado, they're willing to pay for it. Why are we making it harder for cattle producers to help consumers meet their demand for products that they're willing to buy? And a couple of reasons that I think it's important to focus on is going back to the basic tenets of inspection. And this is to protect the safety of the food products. And not to say that custom exempt facilities produce beef unsafely, certainly not the case. But there is a benefit of inspection, and especially when that product is being sold outside of the owner of the animal, then there is a liability that comes with that if there are any food safety issues. So food safety is still one of the reasons why the inspection program is a requirement for retail food service in many direct-to-consumer markets of the meat itself. Uh, consumer confidence. One thing that we've learned as an industry is that one bad thing one public event, one foodborne outbreak that's associated with Colorado beef uh, can be really catastrophic, not only for the individual impacted by that food safety issue or the, or the other issue that may arise from that, but the entire industry. And we've seen many, many cases of this happening across the U.S. Unfortunately, I haven't seen anything in the state of Colorado, but there are examples in other states where uh, a foodborne outbreak associated with a local producer who maybe followed uh, the rules, uh, but it was catastrophic. And so utilizing the systems that are in place to maintain the integrity of products and maintain consumer confidence is important. And then the liability piece and understanding and complying with the regulatory requirements really serves a role to protect ranchers and processors from uh, inadvertently violating federal laws. Um, and that's something that we saw happen quite a bit uh, in the past couple of years, especially after the Ranch to Plate Act was fact, where, passed, where uh, producers and processors, it, you know, it's confusing language. And we, they weren't necessarily aware of what it allowed them to do or and what it did not allow them to do. And so we saw examples of uh, producers and processors who were accidentally violating federal laws. And if you violate a federal law, there could be pretty severe consequences, whether they're regulatory or legal. 
uh, that are passed down to the producer or the processor. There were some examples, unfortunately, in, in 2021 where we saw that happen uh, across the across the state. Uh, thankfully, weren't weren't too severe. Uh, so, what does this mean now? And I think uh, I, I want to be mindful of time, but I want to just explore. Uh, some of the opportunities in beef marketing. There's still a tremendous ability to capitalize on consumer desires for these locally raised products, but it requires a bit of innovation. So exploring the market opportunities that do exist, utilizing either the animal fair program and the custom exempt model or beef sales, like the sale of actual meat. Um, what consumers have told us more now than ever before is they're willing to explore. They're willing to buy beef in different ways. Uh, you know, traditionally, when we think about buying beef, it's at a grocery store. It's at the person who produces it down the road that you know, and they sell it at a farmer's market. Consumers have said that they're looking for other ways. They're looking for different markets, and they're willing to be um, considerate of other ways to get beef on their plate. Some of the different market opportunities we can talk about as we move towards the end of the discussion are listed on your screen. Uh, we'll start with freezer beef. Uh, and freezer beef can be either the cell of live shares or the meat itself. Uh, if it's live shares, that's an animal that was harvested at a custom exempt facility. Uh, if it's meat that's frozen, uh, so either, uh, you know, quarters or halves that are frozen, but you're selling the actual meat and not the live animal share, that would require uh, processing at a federally inspected facility or an equivalent facility. One of the best things that we've seen about these freezer beef uh, folks is the ability to sell or to market farm to plate. So to make a connection with their consumer, because in, if it's a live animal, the consumer has a connection to a live animal that they're going to consume the meat from. But if not, they're making a connection to the rancher or the producer who produced the cattle that made the meat that is going in their freezer. And so it gives the opportunity to tell a story about how that beef made its way to their plate. And that's something that, again, consumers have indicated they are willing to pay for the ability to learn and the ability for information about food that they're consuming. Some of the things with uh, freezer beef, especially if it goes uh, through the, the uh, custom exempt program and is based off of live share or live animal agreements, uh, fewer labeling requirements. So if it goes through a federally inspected facility, there are quite stringent labeling requirements that must be adhered to uh, that can be cumbersome, especially at the processing level. So the challenges we've seen with freezer beef, I think the, the picture on the bottom left-hand screen is pretty uh, helpful if you're buying freezer beef. Um, what consumers said is it requires a lot of freezer space. So if they're buying you know, a quarter beef, they have to have the space to store a quarter beef. And that can sometimes be intimidating to a consumer. At the producer level, so if I'm a cattle producer and I'm selling live animal shares, and I'm going to take those live that live animal to a custom exempt processor, I'm then responsible on the back end of taking all of that freezer beef and transporting it to the new owner, the person who owned the live animal share, and now they own the meat that came from that live animal share. And that can be, uh, you know, not only a, 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 a less profitable piece of your operation, but one that can take a tremendous amount of time. And sometimes it's hard to find transportation, a frozen storage transportation, a freezer beef from a processor to the, the new owners. Uh, so we have lots of examples, as you all probably are familiar with, of people who that becomes their job, is to move freezer beef from the processor to the new owner. Uh, farmers markets are probably one of the biggest growing trends that we've seen in Colorado. Uh, one of the things that's kind of neat about a farmers market, and then when you think about it, it, it probably makes a lot of sense. It's amazing to me. I can go to the grocery store and uh, buy lettuce for a dollar, but I go to the farmer's market and all of a sudden it's $10. And what we see at, at farmer's market is consumers tend to not be overly sensitive to pricing. And so they're willing to pay more for some of the attributes that are important to them uh, at the farmer's market. And it's something they're used to paying more for because they're one, making the connection again to the producer. So it's usually the, the, the farmer, rancher, processor who's there selling it to them. They're able to make that connection with where that product's coming from and how it was raised and who raised it. And that's something that's important to them. Uh, if it is meat sold directly to a consumer, it must go through a USDA inspected facility or an equivalent uh, and also must adhere to all of the requirements of USDA. So labeling requirements, processing requirements. So we're still at this point in time selling meat to consumers. And the only way to do that is through a federally inspected or equivalent program. Some of the challenges with farmers markets, and are, these are challenges that we've heard uh, producers indicate to us, um, is that it can be a, a difficult to access 
markets. Sometimes there's a waiting list to join these farmers markets because they're so successful and so large. It can also be sometimes challenging to establish a consumer base. If you've been to a farmer's market, um, you know that it's the people who are there every week and they have the samples. You're going to go back and buy products from them. So it takes some time uh, and takes some ability of the consumer to trust in what they're getting and to have a positive experience so that they'll come back and want that experience again. So it's not something that tends to be instantaneously successful. It tends to the investment of time uh, pays off over time. One of the things that I think is pretty interesting is the on-farm retail. Uh, and this is something that, I'll be quite honest, surprises me the amount of uh, interest that we see of actual on-farm stores uh, of people who are selling uh, products that were produced at their ranch or their operation. We've also seen an increase in online stores. And that's something that um, we were joking about before the presentation. We've all gotten good at doing things online. Online shopping is absolutely one of them. And so we've seen ranchers and producers who are sending their, their cattle through a USDA inspected facility and marketing the products or the meat from the, the beef from those animals, either in an on-farm retail store, there's an example on the, the right-hand side of your screen, or, uh, or an on-farm retail store or an online presence and quite successfully doing so. Uh, still gives the ability for that producer or processor to market that farm to plate story and to make that connection to the, to the individual consumer that consumers are hungry for. Uh, still the requirement that those products uh, go through a federally inspected or equivalent processing facility and adhere to all of the requirements of uh, USDA. So the online piece makes it a much more versatile uh, and much more accessible option for many producers. Um, creating a website today, you can hire companies to do it uh, in a day or in a week. And uh, if you can find the product to market to them, then you can get yourself rolling with an on-farm retail operation. The other thing that I think has a lot of potential in the state of Colorado are these actual on-farm brick and mortar stores. We've seen really uh, be leveraged in other states so I think a lot in the Northeast, this has been something that they've seen, particularly in Pennsylvania, uh, as a piece of agritourism, where you're going to come, take a tour of a ranch, uh, spend a weekend at a dude ranch, and then before you leave, stop by a retail store and buy some of the beef from the cattle that you saw grazing the land while you were here. And that's something that I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, in the state of Colorado. One of the ones that's probably uh, less known about is community-supported agriculture. Uh, this seems to be pretty popular in Colorado. Uh, we tend to think of this as it relates to produce and community gardens, but we're seeing it more and more with beef. And that's where a consumer buys a share of the farm's output. So they're buying a share of what meat comes from the cattle or comes from a steer or a cow. Um, if consumers own the share of the live animal, so if they've purchased that prior to harvest, that would to go through a custom exempt program. So it gives a little bit of flexibility at the producer level if you're part of a CSA or these community supported ag programs and you don't have access to a federally inspected processor, you can still share, sell live shares and utilize a CSA. Um, not all regions have well supported or well established CSAs. The other thing is it can be volatile. Uh, so when you think about what we know about this from a produce perspective, uh, sometimes you have a bad crop and a person has bought shares of a crop and the, the crop doesn't deliver. Uh, and so the volatility of the market can really impact uh, CSAs uh, and how, they, how, um, how consumers uh, get involved in CSAs. And lastly is uh, just traditional retail and food service. Uh, this is certainly the most traditional consumer marketing platform. Uh, there's a well-established consumer base uh, from a producer perspective. Um, the producer is not responsible for marketing direct to the consumer, and that could be a pro or a con. So if you're not a salesperson, maybe this uh, traditional retail food service outlet is the best for you, where you're not responsible directly for marketing to a consumer, and you can leverage an already established consumer base. Uh, federal inspection is required uh, in these traditional retail or food service. So when I say food service, that's uh, meat products going into restaurants or hotels or schools or similar programs. Some of the challenges in this space, it can be really, really hard to get into this market. And there are a couple of programs in Colorado that are helping, or hopefully helping to make it easier for uh, smaller producers to get access to retailer food service. So even if you have fantastic quality products and you're going through a federally inspected program and you have uh, 
product that you can sell into a grocery store, it's not easy to get access all of the time. They're usually looking at higher volume producers. They have negotiated contracts with uh, other food service providers. So there are some programs in place that are working on this, but right now it's still pretty difficult to get access. The other thing that we see is there's usually for many retailers and food service operators, uh, there are contracts that are established where you are expected to meet certain quotas of production. Uh, and that's hard when you're a cattle producer and maybe uh, you don't want to run cattle all year round and you don't want to have uh, harvest ready cattle uh, all of the time. Uh, they really rely on uh, consistency, not only consistency in quality, but consistency in supply. And so these retailers and food service operators aren't wanting to stop around right now. They're wanting to lock in a contract today for all of next year. And that's something that can be a, a, a hurdle for a smaller producer or a mid-sized producer. So as we wrap up some of the challenges that I think would be remiss if we didn't talk about in this space as it relates to direct to consumer marketing, uh, processing capacity, um, without a doubt, one of the largest market hurdles for ranchers and producers that are looking to capitalize on locally produced beef or ranch to consumer beef is having access to actually market your cattle. Um, and we can talk more about this in the, in the Q&A if anyone has questions on this. There's a lot of thoughts on what to do. There's a lot of um, ideas about how to change this, but it's a challenge and it's one that it's not gonna fix itself overnight. We've gotta to work together to address the processing capacity issue. Uh, market access, consolidation of the beef industry that we saw in that first slide demonstrating the structure of the beef industry, that has impacts on the entire supply chain. Whether that's market access to a plant, to a feed yard, to a retailer or to a food service operator, that's not equitable right now. And it's creating some major hurdles uh, that aren't just impacting those who are looking to market products to a retailer or a restaurant, but also those who are looking to market products direct to a consumer. Uh, so it, it has downstream impacts uh, across the entire supply chain. And the other thing that we know, uh, we talked a lot about consumers are the reason why we're here and consumers are the reason why there's such a demand for ranch to consumer beef and locally produced beef. The research also tells us that consumers are nothing if not fickle, um, and they will change their mind at the drop of a hat. So one thing that we have to continue to do is to maintain their trust and maintain their business. And the best way that we can maintain consumer trust in business is to deliver the high quality, safe, nutritious, affordable products that they've come to expect from the beef industry. Uh, and recognize that if, it's, if any of those fail, if it's not deemed safe, if it's no longer high quality, if it's not nutritious, or if it's just too expensive for them, those are beef consumers that are lost. Uh, and so as we kind of explore all of these different market opportunities, those basic tenets of the consumer expectation of beef, we got to keep those in mind because they're going to rely on those even as other things may change about what they want to see when they buy beef at the grocery store, at the farmer's market, from the local rancher, or who knows in the future what online platform might exist for a consumer to buy beef from. But with that, um, I will wrap up uh, and stop talking so that you all can ask questions. And if you have questions uh, outside of this presentation, I've left my email address there on the screen. Um, I love to talk about this. So always feel free to reach out if you have additional questions. Well, thank you. Is there any questions for Dr. Martin that somebody wants to either put in the chat or wants to ask before I start asking all mine? I made a list while I was sitting here. I don't see everybody here. I'm going to go to gallery view here real quick. Um, Dr. Martin, I've got one question and it, it deals a lot with the location that I live here in Burlington, 12 miles from Kansas, mm -hmm. Ray, 15 miles from Nebraska, when you say that meat cannot cross state lines, yeah. unless it's federally inspected, we've had lots of, during this pandemic, we've had lots of people drive to Kansas with their animal to find a plant that will take it on a three to six month notice because some of the local facilities are way out. Mm -hmm. Is that actually a 
problem if we haul our own across state line? So if you own the animal and the animal is harvested and you're bringing the meat back from that animal yourself across the state line, then no, that doesn't violate. Um, it's only if um, that, uh, well, if we look at, it depends on what sort of facility it's harvested in outside of Colorado or those uh, custom exempt facilities in Nebraska or Kansas. Then that's, yes. that's what we're looking at as custom exempt. Yeah, then that would be violating state law or federal law. And so, uh, you know, a couple of examples that we've seen is exactly that. And I'll, I'll give an, a, an example that uh, CDA um, navigated uh, this past fall where uh, beef was um, harvested, a, a cow was harvested, a steer, I don't know, I don't know what it was, was harvested across state lines. The product came back into Colorado, uh, but it was not, the, the cold chain was broken when it came back into Colorado. Uh, and then once it got back into Colorado, there was a call that was made uh, that this beef is in Colorado, was from a custom exempt facility, was produced outside of Colorado. They made that call to the, uh, I believe it was Nebraska Department of Agriculture, and that triggered a USDA inspection. So what that meant locally is that the USDA said, we're going to inspect uh, with a pretty heavy hand, uh, Colorado custom exempt facility. So Generally what happens in the USDA inspection is they're looking at records. There's very little on-site presence for those custom exempt facilities. In the fall, we actually saw USDA uh, officers that were going along with CDA to inspect uh, Colorado facilities that were custom exempt. So, you know, it's, it's hard, I think, to, to catch those situations. And I think USDA knows that it happens, especially in these areas the past year for sure when the supply chain was struggling but also there, it's how do you monitor movement when you're talking about 10 miles or 15 miles? But there are instances where you know, things have happened and it signals an alert from USDA and they start to be more mindful of, okay, well, the programs that are in place right now aren't working in the way that they're intended to work. And I think that's what we're seeing at the state level at least is that, um, our, our state doesn't stay within our state and our products don't stay within our state either. And so is this program that we're utilizing one that is um, serving the purpose it was intended to? And that conversation is happening federally, um, but certainly happening at the state level as well. So my other question or one of my other questions has to do with the Colorado brand law. Mm. So as title to a beef animal, we have a brand law in Colorado, whether it has a brand on it or not, mm -hmm. it has to be brand inspected prior to going to a custom exemption plant mm -hmm. or a federal plant for that. And is that the proof of ownership that's necessary to prove who owns that? So my question is, and I'm going to use, show you my age here. I'm going to use Dick, Jane, and Spot mm -hmm. are buying a third and a third and a third of a beef animal. Does that brand inspection need to be to those individuals as proof of ownership prior in a custom exemption? No. So not under the Ranch to Plate Act, no. Uh, that was one of the requirements. Is there's still just one brand inspection prior to the custom exempt. So the record keeping is really at the producer level of who owns that animal and who were those shares sold to. So it's really a bill of sale type record that would be provided to the CEP and not a brand inspection. Well, in Colorado, the brand inspection is proof of title. Yeah, so and so it's like I... another, it's another type of uh, paperwork, right? That we have to, um, that we have to then have at the production level, at the producer level. So my requirement, if, if, that, uh, if I'm selling that, that animal to those three people, I have to document when I drop him off with brand inspection as the processor, these three people are the owners, right? So I have to tell the custom exempt processor, here are the new owners of this animal. There's still just one brand inspection. Now, how that works logistically is not clear. Uh, and how that works within individual processors we've seen is not consistent. So there are certain cases, especially we've seen on the Western Slope, where processors are requiring 
But by the Range to Plate Act, the requirement is still just for one brand inspection. But then you get into your point of, okay, well, if that is the bill of sale, what does that alternative record look like? And that's the piece that wasn't, it's not well defined in the, the act itself. And it seems to be more processor specific as to what documentation they want to see so that whenever they are inspected by the state, they feel comfortable with the records they provide to the state. But there's no consistency that we've seen right now. Now, what the CDA tells us is that one brain inspection, but still must document ownership. Uh, and that documentation of ownership is what varies from processor to processor. Okay. So Mary's asking, or she's saying that this was a fantastic presentation, great presentation. And uh, she's wondering if a beef quality assurance certificate or certification is worth obtaining. Yeah, that's a really great question. So we're actually hopeful to do some research on that uh, here soon to see if consumers recognize the BQA program and if they're willing to pay more for cattle that come from BQA certified uh, producers. The data on that right now is not clear about that particular label. But what we do know is that the, the tenants or the foundations of BQA as it relates to animal welfare and handling and all of those good pieces, that's valuable to a consumer. So what we don't know is, is that sticker that you might see on a label, does that have any value or any recognition at the consumer level? But still the principles do. So I think, yes, I think BQA is certainly a program that has direct market to the consumer, even if the label does not. And then what it can have access to is alternative markets. Where let's say those products are go or those cattle are going through a, a federally inspected facility there are certain restaurants that are looking for, can you document that you have done something to improve animal welfare and to improve animal husbandry? So it becomes marketable as you try to market products even outside of consumers. Other questions for Dr. Martin? Dr. Martin. As you already know, I have a state legislator that is wanting me to do work with them to develop some training on how people get into value-added food production. And one of his key elements that he's concerned about is the fact that there's not enough small meat processors in the state. As I've watched your presentation, it is, it occurred to me previously, but as I watch your presentation, it just magnifies the thoughts and ideas. A lot of the issue could be based on Colorado law at the moment, and maybe that needs change from a legislative standpoint. Do you have any thoughts about that theory as well as how to address it? Yeah, that's a really great question and one that we've been having for a couple of, um, certainly in the past few months. So a couple of key pieces. The uh, current custom exempt program in Colorado is sunsetting in 2023, uh, which means that that for um, approval again uh, at the state legislature, is, it, is this a program that Colorado is going to continue? Will it be modified? What might it look like? Uh, so most importantly, I think if we want to change, now's the time uh, to have these conversations about what might change look like. One of the things that's most often brought up is from an access to market perspective, federal inspection or the equivalent gives the producer and the processor the most market access, uh, both interstate, intrastate, and even on the export market. Colorado, historically, uh, when these conversations about state inspection have been brought up, um, it's kind of been bypassed pretty quickly as there's not enough demand. There's not enough producer demand for small processing in Colorado. There's not enough processor demand for the business uh, because producers aren't sending their cattle or pigs or sheep or goats there. And then consumers aren't as um, mindful of location of practice or production. That's changed. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, and what we're really working with CDA on right now, is having a, an honest and intentional conversation about maybe the conclusion is the same, that state inspection is not viable in the state of Colorado. We don't need to go down that path. But I think it's important that we view this as an opportunity to at least really thoughtfully have that conversation of will that help Colorado cattle producers and will that help Colorado pork producers and meat processors? And if it will help, do we have the financial support to do it? 
and is it a program that the state can support? Um, and we've we've not had that conversation in a while, um, not, not since I've been here in an earnest way, and the industry has changed over the past couple of years. So I think we'll see at the state level conversations in that space of can we, you know, we, we know we can change legislature, we're going to have to decide if we want to, and if we want to, how does it need to change? So I think conversations like this, um, you know, interacting with, uh, for people watching this or either now or later to interact with your extension uh, uh, personnel within your counties to talk with your state legislature leaders. Um, we need, this is the time to have these conversations and be able to make a change that benefits the industry while we have the opportunity to do so. Are there any other questions for Dr. Martin? Because I have one final question. If there, if nobody else has one. So I did set in on your CSU's presentation the other day when we were talking with uh, USDA um, about the amount of funds that are going to be made available to look at this issue of the supply chain, what do I want to call it? Shortage, not necessarily shortage, but uh, bottleneck that we have. From your perspective, and you have a unique one, are there several individuals in Colorado that are reaching out to you, wondering about information? Is this something that we're going to see possibility of more facilities to help in the state of Colorado? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, what Travis is talking about on Tuesday of this week, CSU hosted a webinar with USDA officials to talk about uh, the Biden-Harris administration announced last year that they were investing $1 billion in the meat and poultry supply chain. Uh, and there's some specific funding that's intended for processors. So about half a mil or $500 million and this grant program was about, or this webinar was about grants and loans that would be available for processors to enhance capacity either through construction of new facilities, expansion of existing facilities or equipment. Uh, I will say that we've been working with over the past couple of years at CSU, um, I would say from the time of conversation to actual planning about seven to eight people, groups of people usually who are interested in construction of new facilities. Um, what often is a hurdle is not only uh, capital costs, uh, but uh, regulations that exist from an environmental perspective at the county level, in some cases, even at the state level. So the construction of new facilities, um, I think we've got some work to do to make that happen. Usually what we've seen is if the, per if the person can find the money and have the business plan and even get approval, one of the things that we're starting to notice is the workforce is a huge challenge. Uh, so a good example in brush, the brush land plant, they're struggling with labor and, you know, have a brand new, beautiful federally inspected facility, uh, but they have a hard time keeping employees in that facility. And we've seen that across the state. So I think to your question, like, is there room? Certainly. Is there money? Absolutely. Can we, do we have people who are crossing those barriers? Yep. But then they get to the point of there's not a skilled workforce to actually be in the plant um, to do the job. And so I think this, the investment of funds that the Biden-Harris administration is making is a huge first step of helping producers and processors build the facilities or expand the facilities to increase capacity. But we have a lot of work to do on making sure that there are people who can go in and work in those spaces. Because even if we have a brand new, beautiful, federally inspected facility in Yuma County, uh, if there's not a labor, then it becomes a dust magnet pretty quick. Uh, and that's the piece that is probably one of the parts that we don't talk about enough that's one of, going to be continuously one of the most challenging um, because we don't have students who are graduating every day wanting to be meat cutters uh, and it's a hard job uh, and it's something that it, it's going to have to be really creative in how we meet the demand for labor. Well with that Dr. Martin I want to thank you for your time. We've uh, You're one of the few that I can get to stick to that hour. Oh, I wow. appreciate it. That's <laughs> awesome. I, I appreciate that immensely. Um, I will, like I it was talking earlier with those of you that are on here, we will have this recorded. And as we get these put up, 
I'll send everybody that's registered links to this so that they can go back and review it. Um, I want to say please join us for the final installment next week when Dr. Frank Gary comes on and talks about fundamentals of infectious disease prevention and beef herds, more safety issues as we're talking about. So with that, join us again next Thursday at 530 um, for our final installment of Better With Beef 2022. Thank you.